It's past my bedtime, you guys. I stayed up for you guys, okay? So ask some good questions so I can go to sleep. Okay? So how do we start this? The lights right here. I'm going to put them on here. Okay. I got one. I got one. Or you just shout it in the air. Give me five good advices when I travel. <laughs> <laughs> five, five big mistakes you've done when you've been traveling. Five mistakes? Okay. I'm from America. We don't use army time. Okay? We use regular time. So I've missed two flights to China. Okay, I missed two flights to China because I misread it. It was at midnight, which I thought was midday, okay, <laughs> afternoon. So when you read your itinerary, which is your flights, make sure you read the right flights, okay? Okay, there's one. Always give yourself time when you're getting to travel. Sometimes we wake up and we're like, okay, it's an hour bus ride, and I'll be getting checking in before 45 minutes, okay? Yo, if the bus gets a flat, or the traffic is there, and you're rushing from one terminal, and you arrive to the terminal, and you don't know the terminal that you're at, it's terminal five, when you're actually in terminal two, you're actually gonna be running across the whole airport trying to make it because of this damn brake life. You get me? Yeah? Okay? Freeze and I were running from one terminal to the other, and he said, Paul, you should talk about how hard it is to keep track of it. So, yeah, more? Another one. Three. Another one? Five. Is that three? Three. three. Hmm, I don't know. Bring fresh clothes, y'all. <laughs> yeah. Pack light. Pack light. Yeah. Pack light. And uh, make sure you have enough money in your bank account. <laughs> because if you don't get paid from the event, you're not going to eat. You know what I'm saying? So be, be careful, you guys. Be alert. Yeah. <laughs> don't forget your passport. And if you need a visa, and you don't know that the country needs a visa to get into, they're going to send you back on a 12-hour flight, so be ready. <laughs> I have a question. Okay. Who started Style Elements and why? Style Elements uh, and why? Yeah, Very right. good question. Okay, Style Elements was formed at the end of 94, beginning of 95. And uh, we, uh, it was Ivan and Remind came up with the name Style Elements. And uh, the group was actually influenced by Jam on the Groove, Ghetto Original, okay? We wanted to do what rhythm technicians and rock steady crew was doing, okay? And they were performing and putting hip hop in theaters. They set the, the standards, you guys. Rhythm technicians and rock steady set the standards to bring hip hop in the theater into a professional, professional level. When we saw that, Ivan said, yo, Paul, we can do this, all right? So we gathered up a group of dancers with different styles and we wanted to do that. Okay? And that's why it was formed. But then you have to get respect and recognition. So basically, you have to enter battles, get your respect, start winning battles, whatever, and the crew started getting its recognition, and then we started doing shows and stuff like that. Then some of the members got into Jam on the Group, got original comes in your mind, and the rest is history. Okay? That's how we do it. Good question. I'm very clever, Dave. <laughs> Any other questions you got? Let's go ahead, focus. I didn't have a passport. Fucking <laughs> Merkins. As simple as that, I didn't have a passport. How did you get to break it? How was your contact to Okay, I was a strutter first. Okay, a strutter. A strutter. What's a strutter? It's wow, hitting and turning. Boom. It's a West Coast thing. Okay? It's a precursor to pop it. Yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah. People call it popping now, but in my neighborhood, we, we strutted. I'm from San Jose, California. You know, you had popping, which is a different style. You had strutting, you had bopping, and all that stuff. So, you know, you had hitting, you had tutters, you had wavers. It was all different styles that existed. Okay, my first crew was streetwise strutters. So, at the age of 10, it was around 1980, okay, I started strutting. All right? Um, so, in 10 years old, you're probably in third grade. Because at six years old, you're in kindergarten, seven, eight, nine, so I was probably fifth grade, actually. Okay, fifth grade, right? Stretch? About fifth grade, right? About that. Yeah, it's how American systems work in their, their schools. You have what is called show and tell when you're in school. Okay? Show and tell is when you can bring your dad if he's a fireman, or you bring a puppy, or your favorite parrot, or what kind of animal, and they bring it. I used to go to school and I would bring a little portable record player and I 
I would play Funky Town. And then I would start mining and roboting and hitting. And that was my show and tell in school. Okay? That's how I got into the culture first. My mother had a lady, uh, my mother had a good friend. And when my mother would go to work, that friend would um, her friend would take care of me. And she would have her two boys watch me. And those two boys would stand in front of the mirror and they would mine and they would do the bicycle thing on the side of the mirror that everybody does and they would front slide and back slide and I was a little 10 years old playing with my Star Wars figures who's into Star Wars? nobody's into Star Wars and then you know what I'm talking about okay? so Luke Skywalker everybody has the force right? yo when you see them float and you're looking at them it looked like what you saw in the movies it looked unreal it looked fresh so then I got into that Okay. Then my cousins came from New York. We're actually from Staten Island, New York. It's rum and rum. Okay. They were mainly writers. They weren't really b-boys, but they messed around with them a little bit. Uh, rum more than rum. Okay. And um, my mother said, "Go in the living room and entertain them." So I bring my lady here and I start robot. And we do the family thing. And the living room was mainly where everybody kind of went off. The living room, the family gatherings, and everybody kind of goes and dances. Okay. So I'm doing my robot thing, and my cousins are standing there. They were dressed, they had these pants on, AJs. It was kind of like church pants, really like slacks. And they were called AJs. And they had some, uh, if I remember correctly, probably some British walkers. Or they looked like Clarks, what you guys would call Clarks, right? And they were just standing there and just watching me. And they had an attitude, arms crossed and everything. And I'm like, what's wrong with these guys? All right, they, they're not liking what I do, because they were just like this. Then they threw down, and they did a knee spin and butt spin and a couple of kicks and stuff, and I had never seen that in my life. I had never seen breaking in my life. That was 1982, I was 12 years old, after two years that I started struggling. So that's how I got into it, all right? After that, it grabbed me. Okay, cool? All right, good question. Uh, how did your family or your culture at home uh, influence or support? Oh. Well, my father wasn't too supportive, my mother was. My father was, my father's kind of a bit racist. He's Bolivian, okay? So he was always saying, ah, you're trying to be black, you're trying to do this, that. So he was a little bit offensive, all right? But my mother, being Puerto Rican, she was like, hey, mijo, get down, do that stuff, you know? So in my family, there was always music. They were always dancing. It was like, if, if it was early in the morning and the music went on, it meant breakfast was ready, and it was time to wake up, okay? So I would be going to the bathroom, you know, when you wake up early in the morning, you have to pee as a little kid, right? So you run into the bathroom. My auntie, my Aunt Gladys, she would grab me and start dancing salsa with me while I'm trying to go pee. And I'm like, oh, okay, I'm going to go pee, okay, why? Wow. And I would go pee, all right, and then I would come back. So I think all that kind of stuff kind of influenced me, watching the guys in my neighborhood, they'll be drinking rum and stuff like that on the corner. And the way they cut their shorts and wearing their wife beater with the cross and the way they would slap the skin on the congos, you know, all that. It's kind of like that whole shoulder thing, the, the way they would look and the way they would talk to the girls. It, it kind of, I think, it, you pick it up because it looks cool. As a little kid, you kind of look at it and it's like, okay, cool. That looks kind of smooth. They get the girls in the neighborhood. So you kind of, how do you say, huh? You kind of just pick it up, you know? So I think the games in my neighborhood, the people in my neighborhood, my family has been a big influence on me. When you're a little kid, when you're a baby, who has kids here? Raise your hands. Okay? Wow. Really? Yo, really? You're, you're doing good, because in America, mad kids will raise their hand. Yo, but, yo, but I'll be honest. When you're about, you know, when they're teaching you how to walk, Usually when you grab a little kid, you put them on your feet, right? Smart, bro. You grab a little kid, you put them on their feet, and you walk with them, and they're looking up at you, and you're holding their hands, and you put their feet on your feet. My mother would put my feet on her feet, and she would dance salsa. So I'm looking at her, and she's moving her feet. So I think when you see me rock and move my shoulders a certain way, it's what my mom taught me. It's what the neighborhood kind of taught me. So I think... That's a big influence for me. Okay, you are, you are.
are, it's like third base used to say, there is, you are a product of your environment, bottom, bottom line. Okay? Cool. That was good. And the more I learn about dance and, and the more I listen, there's small sounds and details that I didn't hear before in the same song. You know what I'm saying? So I think the older I get, the more understanding I got, I'm getting of music. Watching stretch, watching a lot of funk dances. Like I don't want, I, I try to, instead of watching a dancer, I kind of um, try to, my eyes become ears. And I try to listen to the dancer through my vision to see what they're feeling and you capture that kind of feeling you know so I think uh, I think I've learned the more I kind of pay attention and the more I see and feel the more I begin to hear sounds that I didn't hear before the smallest little things in the background so it, it really depends man it really depends on how I'm feeling that day sometimes I just feel like not paying attention to anything and I just want to hit the hi-hat and just kind of go off and then there's other times I'm like yo this trumpet is funky it's making me move and you focus on the trumpet you know what I mean Freeze and I in a workshop were doing that same exercise telling the b-boys because a lot of b-boys focus just on the clap and then on the simple ah, big sound so we were saying no pick one sound out of the out of the normal sounds that you usually listen to and try to dissect that so it's really it's, it's just really how you feel. You know, I, I don't have a particular sound that I like. Um, if the song moves me, it moves me. And I'll listen to things in it. But good question. Yeah, beautiful. All right. Any other questions, Joe? Since we all know you three guys, when and how did you met these two? Ah, we met them uh, dancing. Okay, Storm, I'm a big fan of Storm. First time I saw European Breaking, I, got, I, I became real good friends with Thomas from Battle of the Year. Okay, he was on a crew called uh, Bernie, Moves. Bernie Moves. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm a writer, a graph writer as well. Okay, I'm a writer. So there was a magazine, a European magazine, I think it was Graphotism, if I'm not mistaken. It was a European magazine and had a little advertisement for Battle of the Year 1995. All right. So I wasn't able to make it, or the crew style elements wasn't able to make it. Um, we weren't organized back then too well. So um, I, I stayed pay, petty pals. Back then there was no internet, we had beepers, there was no cell phones really, unless you had money. And um, so we, I would call his house. The number that was on the advertisement, it was actually his home recorder. And it had the Beat Street anthem from the movie Beat Street. And I never had called Europe in my life, so I didn't know about the 001 and all that, so the operator had to help me call. And I got this recorded, you guys. I leave a message, and Thomas happens to call back. And we become friends, okay? And he explains to me about the European scene. Since I wasn't able to go in 95, he sends me four VHS tapes, okay? And in, and in those days, if you put VHS tapes on slow record, you can record five hours on each tape. So each tape had five hours on it of all European history. Okay, not all European history, but it had a lot. It had Throw Down Rockets, it had News Per Minute, it had um, Out of Control, it had Wedding B-Boys, it had Battle Squad, it had um, Always Rockin' Tough from the UK, this goes on Actual Force, and all these crews. And I was like, wow, Europe is really breaking hard. And Battle of the Year, that year, 1995, for me was one of the best years. The energy in that year was crazy. But all the history in that from 91, or 90, 91, 92, 93, had Storm in them representing. Okay? So when I saw Storm, I was like, who the hell is that guy? And then the more tapes I started getting of Zulu Nation Anniversary in New York City, Storm and, and Battle Squad went there, Swift Rock, Maurizio, and all that. And um, I started following the European scene, and it hyped me up to train. And I told my crew style, I said, well, we gotta go to Europe. We got a battle with guys in Europe. And then we came in 1997, and we smoked together. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was the year the dope crews didn't go. <laughs> All right? No, but that's how I met them, okay? Kevin I met later. What year did we meet, Kevin? 98. 98, maybe? 98? 98. 
When did you come to Laces, UK first? Laces yeah. Jam. Laces Jam was 99. Did you come to Battle that? Royale. Did you come to the bank break thing or was that crossing them? I don't know. But I met him about 98, 99, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And we hit it off straight up. You know? Mauricio, I met in 1998. Pro Am. 1997 was my first trip to Europe. And I went directly to France. Air Force crew from Los Angeles invited me to, uh, to Europe to do a show. So I did the show and I went to a, a real dope place, a subway station, an underground subway station called Chatelet. Okay, Chatelet. And all the major, major battles and training sessions were there in Paris. And I got to see Actual Force live. And then I battled. Okay, they called us out. Little Caesar, Chuko, tough kid from Switzerland was doing the show with us, myself. And we battled. And we became friends. And then I became part of the crew, Actual Force that year, 1997. So it was like a dream come true. The school I'm from is, if you get influenced by somebody, okay, um, instead of just taking from them and not giving credit or, or taking and not like uh, acknowledging what you get something from, you actually try to go to the source. In 1995, I went to New York City to Rockstead Anniversary to go to the source, okay, to study why I moved the way I moved. Why I see, you gotta study the source, okay? You see everything. From the moment you get involved in hip hop, how many people got posters and clippings when you first got involved in the culture, there was no YouTube and stuff. Some of you guys are YouTube generation, some of you guys are not. But any little information you had, you studied everything, the way they stand, the way they dress, the way they put their shoes. Who still does it today? Raise your hand. Okay. That's studying the culture, the root. So when I went to France, a lot of my sweeps that I got, a lot of the eight balls, what, what in Europe they call pretzels, okay? I was watching Gabon and Kareem and Storm and Swift. Even though Kuriaki and Buck Four were doing it, there was a certain touch that Gabon had because he pays attention to a lot of Shaolin movies. So he had a certain way of doing it that attracted me, all right? So, my main thing was when I saw them live at Chatelet, I was like, this is my chance to show them what I learned from them. How it added to my arsenal, my own style. And then we became friends and they liked what I built off it. And they were building off what I built off it. And then I started building off what they built off it too. And it just became family. And it was the connection, you know? That's how I got to know the European scene. I think that's why I'm here today at IBM talking to you. Good question. Hold on. Go ahead. Uh, uh, is there anything that you will regret? Um, no. <laughs> I would say this. I'm a 44-year-old man, you guys, that loves dancing. All right? I'm a dancer. Through all the knee surgeries, the broken collarbones, the slip this in the neck, the twisted ankles, broken tendons, I don't think I would regret anything. Because it, can, it comes with the territory with any passion you have. Okay? Any passion you have, I think you give it your all. My mother said, give it your all. James Brown says, get into it, get involved. Alright? So I think I would never regret what I've done. I've lost things along the way that hurt but I can say, when I die, I did it my way. And that's the most important thing. Do it your way. All right? Did you uh, accept the surgeries? Did you ever had a, a stop in breaking? Like you said, I don't want to do it anymore. Oh, yeah. And why? And why? Okay. What are your thoughts? Why you were starting again? All right, great question. I love these questions. Okay, um, I started in 82 breaking. Um, the big boom. Um, Nest likes to call it the bandwagon, uh, bandwagon era. It's when the whole world kind of got into breaking through the movies and commercial era. Um, um, and it's true. It's kind of like we got on to the, the 80s era. Everything was developing. Everything was uh, being, the transitions, everything was being developed. By 85, um, you know, you reach puberty. 
you know, I was 12 years old when I started, 82. By 85, I started slowing down, and hip hop kind of started changing, okay? Um, by 86, I completely stopped, all right? But I was still going to clubs and stuff like that. It was a very dark age because, let's say, for instance, um, gangster rap started coming into play. NWA came out 86, Ice-T came out 86, and it's like they started um, glorifying a lot like the women from party music, like Grandmaster Flash and everybody just rocking and rocking the house and Rapper's Delight and all, all this party music. It started turning into, even though like Melly Mel, you know, sometimes it makes me wonder how I keep them going under the jungle, you know, concrete jungle song, even though it was hard, it was still a fresh song to rock to. It didn't really cuss you out. But when NWA came out, fuck the police and bitch and hoe and fuck shit and my AKA, and I, it changed. Hip hop changed. And it was like, you would go to a club and you would try to break. And it was like, I'll be honest, people would actually clown you. They would actually diss you. They would pour their drink on purpose or break a glass on the floor. Or they would walk in the middle of the floor or they would grab their legs and their feet and do a little egg roll thing and then laugh at you. And then the rest of the crowd would laugh at you. So you would get pissed and you would end up fighting the guy. And then you would get jumped by 10 of his homies so you would go to, you would go home, tell your boys what happened, and then you would go to the club the next weekend, okay? And instead of going to dance, you would be looking for the dudes that, that jumped you. So you'd be dancing with your girl and paying attention to your peripheral vision and seeing who jumped you. Then you would go to the bathroom, then you saw them walk in the bathroom, you would, you would stay on either side of the hallway, and when they walked out of the bathroom, you would jump them and give them the same thing you did. So it was a dark age, okay? Even though you wanted to dance, it just wasn't happening, okay? You were just doing social dances and party dances. You were doing the huevo, you were the feli, the cabbage patch, the troop, the earthquake, the Gucci. It's like, these were the dances you started doing. A lot of freestyle music was coming into play, and like, it's just a different time. I stopped, even though in my heart I wanted to dance. Why? Actually, you were stopping like today, Nowadays we have practice rooms, so maybe it's for you, it was a street or a mall or something like this. Why you stop? The club is, I think, it's another part. Like, hey, go club, have fun. Well, it's most safe, of us, most practice. of us, there wasn't really practice. Like, yeah, we had community centers, but they weren't that big. We got down in clubs and basements and the house parties. Yeah. Going to people's backyards. If you heard the music down the street and you heard music, you would crash the party. You know what I mean? You would crash the party, you would go, and if you could get in, because you had to be careful, because if you really, if you went to the house party and you really kind of um, made noise and you were out doing all the dances from that house party, you will get run out of the house party. But you followed where it went. You followed the music, and the parties is where the dancers were. It wasn't organized competitions like now, okay, and separate competition, it wasn't like that. If you wanted to compete, it was usually a talent show, and you were competing against tap dancers and everything. But if you wanted to battle, if I was at an arcade playing Donkey Kong or Crazy Climber or Joust or Galaxy, Joust. you know, yo, and my hat was tilted to the side, I guarantee you somebody would tap you on the shoulder, and they'll say, yo, you break? And you say, yeah, I break. I say, come outside. And you would break, you know? And to see somebody's move, that's how it was. You battle, you know? But then it changed. It got really, I would be honest, people started getting really crazy about biting and about, um, there was a lot of pride and ego and it got really corny with all the commercials and cornflake commercials and people with candy bars and all that stuff. It got really kind of corny so we kind of lost a lot of respect in the street. So when you started doing it, you kind of lost it. You know what I mean? But it went a different route. You know, but thank God, like, people in their hearts still had it. You had brothers, like, coming out later on. They were there in the 80s, but, like, Buddha Stretch, for me, was a big motivation. Mob Tops, yo, Mob Tops, when I saw Mob Tops, probably about, when was Wrecking Shot made, 92? Yeah. Okay, a tape came to Puerto Rico, and we were all freestyle dancing. We were all freestylers. I would mix in a 1990 or a split, but we were not staying on the floor. It just wasn't cool. People would diss you. When my
tops came out, it, it brought in a whole different energy. Okay? And that came in, and then all of a sudden, people started breaking again. Like, all of a sudden, Rocksteady comes out on the grind in 94, 95. Was it 94, 95? 93. When Rocksteady came out on the grind on old school. It was 93. MTF, they came out, and it was like, ah, oh, they're doing it again. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play around a little bit. So I started doing it again. Then Soul Train, on, on Soul Train, you had Air Force crew coming out, Little Caesar doing his thing. And I was like, oh wow, everybody's coming back out. I'm gonna start training again. I was, how to say, I was 235 pounds, you guys. You know how much that weight is in kilos? 115. Huh? 115 kilos. What? Thanks, <laughs> stop. You were Okay. You know? I did a little bit of time, so I got really big and pumped. And the, the, the thing from 86 all the way up, it was, it was about, I'll be honest, gangsters, and it was about the whole thing changed. You know, we learned how to, you know, we learned how to slap and, and put up our hands, and everything was about lifting. All those videos you see on the West Coast, when you see Dr. Dre in front of his house, and they're pumping iron in the front, that's how it was. We would stay every day in our garage, playing pool, lifting weights, and drinking 40s from 86 all the way to 89. Okay? And going to clubs and looking for trouble. Even the peace on earth pole that you see now is because I lost a lot of friends in that process. Okay? So I thank God every day that in my heart I still wanted to dance. I never got caught up with the peer pressure too much and that I'm here today. So I hope that answered your question a little bit. How long my break was about seven years, eight years, yeah. From 86, no breaking, all the way up to, let's say, 91, 92. So you do the math, okay? If it wasn't for Stilo, my cousin Stilo, does everybody know Stilo here from California? You know, thank God he's still alive because he went through some stuff. He asked me to teach him because his older brother, um, I used to do some work with his older brother Joe. His older brother Joe's from the Bronx, and Stilo's from the Bronx. We're cousins, okay? Um, Joe told Stilo, oh, Poe used to break in the 80s. And Stilo had saw a little clip of breaking, and he wanted to learn. This is 1992, all right? If it wasn't for Stilo asking me to teach him, I don't think I would have started again, okay? And Rocksteady later on in 93, 94. But it kind of happened all of a sudden, kind of in that time from 92 up, things started to appear again. Lords of the Underground came out with Chief Rocker and Quick Step and Crazy Legs was in that video and breaking started to appear again. Mad Lion had Ken Swift doing it, you know? And so, yeah. Good question, go ahead, Fraser. I know you're a graffiti writer. How big influence is that in your dancing and other things that you Wow. Great question. I'm a writer, as you guys found out now, for those that don't know. Um, he asked me if you didn't hear him, because he has a real deep, soft voice. It's like, um, he said, how does writing influence my dancing? The lean in the letter, the swirl at the end, the way an arrow flows, the way a bar goes through. Sometimes when I'm breaking, I try to create letters. I try to create styles out of letters that I know, okay? I think um, when you see b-boy characters with the monkey sideways, and they're like this, and they have their big belly and the way they're standing, the Von Bode influence, the character of Von Bode, those brought it in from TC5 into the breaking era. So all those b-boys you see sideways, the big hands with the shoes and, and the neck leaning, all those freezes, the way it feels, to me, that's what it's about, okay? So the influence of writing, if a letter is straight, it has no movement. Once the letter leans, it has movement, and it creates the style. If an MC stands on the, on, on the stage and just raps you, nothing, you guys don't feel that shit. But if an MC's rock, rocking in and moving and, and using his lyrics and his hands and everything, that's the letter. That's the influence. If the DJ just does this, 
if you're looking at the DJ and the DJ is doing this and no motion, sooner or later you get bored and you go rock the house with the people. But once the DJ is in tune with the crowd and he's moving and, and he's looking and he's about to throw a record, he's whoop, whoop, and he points and he, all that, that's the feeling, so that's wrong, feeling, bro. that's soul. It's all related, you guys. You understand what I'm saying? Without the DJ, there is no us. What's missing? In the majority, character and soul. I see what you guys practice, but I don't see what you feel. You understand what I mean? And that's not a disrespect. We say it all the time in our workshops and stuff. We say, okay, this is a one-two step, and I see many people, but where's the small changing the step and the feeling? Abstract likes to say it like this. You do what you practice, I do what I feel. You understand what I'm saying? So I think the more you use your influences, what, what I see today's generation is breakers are watching breakers. So the gestures and the nuances have become all the same. But the original dancers, the breakers, didn't have videos to watch of other breakers. They watched Nicholas Brothers, The Three Stooges, Shirley Temple, The Little Rascals, Shaolin Kung Fu movies, all that. So when you see me, Fred Astaire, uh, Charlie Chaplin, when you see me walk in a circle, boom, 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 stop, lift my hat, and move, and go in, all that is Charlie Chaplin to me. I'm not trying to be a b-boy, I am a b-boy. A b-boy is trying to be a character that they see from cartoons and everything like that. Okay? I think that's missing. The formula of what you guys think b-boying is, has been meshed into all you guys doing this, thinking it's the b-boy style. Nah. That's Ken Swift in Beat Street being Bruce Lee. Okay? And Wild Style. When you see Game of Death, when Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, was it Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, he's about to fight Bruce Lee. And Bruce Lee does this. And he does the circle, right? And then he goes, right? Okay, all of that, that's Game of Death. Game of Death. Yeah. Yo, or End of the Dragon. No, Game of Death. Game of Death, yeah. Game of Death. Yo, so when, and you know, when we pull up our pants when we're breaking, we do this. Like sometimes you see us top rock, and right before we go down, we do the kick, we lift our pants, and all this, and boom, that's Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee, before he kicks, he kicks us, and he kicks up, and then he comes in. All that bounce, boom, and coming in, all the hands, the blocks, that ain't b-boying. That's Kung Fu influence. But most of you guys think that you have to do that because it's b-boying or breaking. Nah, man, it's a bunch of kids, 12 years old, 13 years old. Uh, playing cops and robbers. Who's played cops and robbers when you were kids? How many people? Raise your hand. How many of you guys played cops and robbers in the circle? See that? You need to bring the games that you play as a little kid into the circle. That's where all the mugsy coming in like boom and stepping. That's all the games. So the opening the jackets when you see hustlers on the street or perverts. You see a guy with a long jacket walking and then he's naked underneath the jacket and you don't know. And then all of a sudden he goes, ah, ah, and he leaves. Okay? Right? So that, when you see when you see a hustler with a long trench coat and he goes like this, he goes, yo, you want to buy a watch? And the watches are there. Or you see Elliot Ness, not Elliot Ness, but Elliot Ness, the gangsters, with Muggsy and all those guys. They'll pull out their shotguns out here. When you see Ken Swift going, wow. He's opening the jacket and he's showing his name from the belt buckle to the moon. And he's chilling, he's like, boom. He's showing you your wep his weapons. It's not, I see a lot of people doing it, but not knowing why they do it. And I think the definition is missing because if you know why you're doing it, the character will come out more. I think that's missing. I think more people are imitating because they think it's breaking instead of actually learning why it is that way. You understand what I mean? Very good question, brother. Any other questions, you guys? Go ahead, brother. Uh, 
how I can get not too much inspired by someone because uh, for me personally uh, I like to see Sonny T dancing. Sonny so T is incredible. And he inspired me a lot. And sometimes when I dance and after that I feel oh this was like Sonny. So so yeah, what I was doing is was similar to Sonny and how I can get not that much inspired. Well, if you use other influences, that other, other influence will come out as well. Okay, to answer your question, I'm a little bit of a mix of everything I've seen in my life. So, I can break down a style and say, yo, this is from Float, this is from so-and-so, this is from Brutus Stretch, this is from Storm. I can say it. You know, this is from Ness, this is from so-and-so, this is from Focus, Freeze. But I know this. I'm humble enough to say, yo, I know this. You know what I mean? I think we'll always be influenced. We're products of our environment, as simple as that. So if you train with Sonny, you're going to look like the people you train a little bit. But the whole journey is also finding other influences. So if you want to find your other influence, you need to stray away. You need to travel. And you need to mingle with other cultures. And you need to see other influences. And that will begin to come out. You know, give yourself games when you train. When I'm training, I give myself concepts to try something different. Let's say, for instance, if I told you, uh, show me one go down, right? One go down. Um, you show me the go down, you do it. I say, okay, now show me five different feelings to do that go down. Feelings, okay? Don't do the go down differently, do the feeling differently. And what I mean is, um, some people have heard me in my workshop say this, um, when you talk, Depending on your tone of voice, how you say it, will tell the person if you're mad, sad, angry, happy, scared, right? If I say to Storm, yo Storm, my moves, yo Storm, is that, my, that's my move. If my moves were words, the tone of voice, how I'm saying it is going to determine how I do it. So I say, yo Storm, that sounds like I'm excited to tell him something. But let's say it's another day, and I go... Yo, Storm, same words, changes a little bit. Let's say I'm mad, he made me mad, and I say, Yo, Storm, same words, but a different feeling. A lot of people are doing the same thing the way they break, the same tone for any music, and that's wrong. I feel it's wrong because you're not, you're doing what you practice and not how the song actually feels, how it makes you feel. What's your tone of voice when you do it? You know, you understand what I mean? So, the way you talk every day, when you're sad, happy, angry, scared, use that in your breaking. Make your move say how you feel. Not what you train. It's not gymnastics, it's, it's a feeling. Does that make sense, you guys? Yeah. Cool. More, you guys? Because I want to go to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> Easy one. Easy if one. You, if your mother is Puerto Rican yeah. and your father is from Bolivia, why are you white? <laughs> Yo, my father's, my sister's is dog is Stretch. Okay? And Kevin. In Puerto Rican blood, you have Spaniard, Taino, Native, and African. Okay? My dad's side, you just have native um, Aztecs or whatever was in Bolivia. I don't know too much of the history there. I only know my Puerto Rican side a lot more. But my dad's dark brown. My mother's as white as me with green eyes and her mother. But her dad is as African as Kevin and Stretch. Don't look at Stone because he's not African. <laughs> but you know what I mean? So I could marry a white woman and have a dark kid. It's in the genes, it's the blood. If, if, if you believe it, that if you right. look, no, it's the way it is. It's called DNA, look, bro. Yeah, it's, it's called DNA. DNA. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's fact. Science, look at bro. Alien Ness. He's Puerto Rican just you like me. That. So you, you, you wouldn't be uh, suspicious of any of your friends no. if, you're, if your kid is black? No, not at all. Because in my family, I have every color. You know? So in my family, I learned to, I just said, I used to get pissed that I was the lightest in my family. I used to walk down the block and be the lightest on my block and get teased. And my father used to make fun of me and call, say to, to my mom, oh, you cheated on me with the milkman. 
Okay? But it made me work and show my soul and get accepted that way. You understand what I mean? But this is why I'm okay. I'm proud to be what I do and what I am. You know what I'm saying? We all should be. Good question. Um, I think right now it, most of the money you earn actually make by dancing. Is this right? Mm, not all of it, no. So my question is actually what did you learn? Like you made in school, university, how was your way actually to money next to dancing? All right, good question. I'm a hustler, man. I learned how to hustle on the street, okay? You pay attention to how to do business in the street. Um, at a young age, without even realizing it, you realize when you're rocking your colors on your back, your crew shirt and all that, you're advertising. You learn about advertising. When you throw your own parties, you're learning about marketing and advertising and how to organize stuff. Okay, I didn't go to school for that. I learned watching the elders, how they organize things. I quit school, I quit high school, um, I quit high school before graduating. Then I went back to get my GED in uh, 92, all right, or 91, 92. Um, for me, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an observer. I observe things a lot. And without knowing really how to do it, I get it. You understand what I'm saying? When you watch something, sometimes things don't need to be explained to me. I get it, I see it, and I see how it works, all right? And then I learn as I go along. I'm more the type of person hands-on training, okay? Um, I've done many things. I, I never depended on dance to as a career, never. I've always worked a regular job, okay? Um, I worked uh, as a district manager. I became a district manager of a clothing store. We had eight clothing stores in Los Angeles, California. And I managed and I worked with the company for 11 years, okay? And I made my money that way. The agreement with my boss was he would let me leave every month for two weeks as long as I promoted the store, okay? So he let me do what I love to do as long as he can benefit from it by me putting stickers all over the city of the website of the store. Okay, and then I said, okay, cool, if I'm going to do that, then that means any out-of-the-country sales that you make, I want 10%. I'm a hustler, man. Okay, so I said, this is the way I worked it. So I would get, same thing, I, we produced a show, Groovaloos, I'm in a group called the Groovaloos, and we produced a theater show. Okay, the way the theater show works is we had to tell all our real stories in the show. Okay. So I said, okay, if I'm going to tell the real story, then what do we get out of it if I no longer perform in the show? So we made sure the contracts, every time that show is performed, with me or without me, I get my residuals for the choreography that I've done and for my story. Okay? So there's many things that I look at on how to make my income. I do not like making my income come just from dancing, coming to IBE or anything like that. I'm not about that. I don't try to hustle the culture. I hustle my talent, all right, with people that have money, not people that are part of the culture that are barely making ends meet. I barely make rent, you know what I'm saying? If I come here for a week and Tyrone says, yo, Po, we don't have a budget, we only have 200 euros. I make 700 a week from my regular job in Australia. I live in Australia now, okay? I've been there for five and a half years. If I make 700 a week after taxes, after all the taxes taken out, and I come here for a week or two weeks and I only make 200 euro, then when I get home, I don't have rent to pay. So I have to find a way to keep generating money. So what I do is I talk with the government in Australia. I organize after school programs. I do grants, three grants a year. I get funding from that. I work and I help develop the kids and what they want to do, if they want to make beats, if they whatever. I get a, a, a project happening and I bring in a beat maker, an MC, a graph writer. I just bring in mad people and then I leave and the project is happening. And then I get my cut for organizing the project. But that's government money. Okay? This is how I do it. I don't try to hustle the culture like from my own friends. 
I do things for free. I'll do a couple of workshops, make 200, 300 euro, but that's really just to eat, you know? So, yeah, there's many things you could. Did I answer your question a little bit? Cool. All right. The brand? Yeah. Uh, the, the store was called Workman's Outlet. Workman's Outlet. Yeah, on Melrose Avenue. We had three stores in Melrose, one in Miami, one in Las Vegas. Yes. Kept going. We had seven stores total and then online. Okay. I also have a clothing brand, you guys, that's coming out now. It's called Civilian Issue. Okay. Civilian Issue is basically, civilians is us, and issue can be a metaphor as an issue, as a problem, like I have an issue with you or issue to give, I issue you something, okay? So what I'm doing with this project now, so be on the lookout, you guys, because your support supports the people that it's for, okay? Um, what it is, is the reason it's called Civilian Issue is, out of the brand, um, what I'm trying to do is create a grant fund. There's a lot of kids that I meet in Brazil and ghettos around the world that don't have the opportunity to be seen. And they're just as talented or even better than guys that are sponsored in Red Bull, guys that are traveling all around the world that are actually do, making stuff happen. These guys are more talented, but they don't get the opportunity to be seen. I go into their ghettos and I see them and I'm like, wow, people need to see you. They apply for grants, they get denied. So I said, you know what, with my connections and the way people know me and stuff like that, I might as well find a way to create a grant fund, which is called Civilian Issue Grant Fund, which the best way I know how is apparel, because I've been involved in fashion all my life. So I said, okay, I'll make this clothing line. Every two or three dollars that is made out of each t-shirt, I put into the grant fund. At the end of the year, if I have two thousand, three thousand dollars, I pick the kid that I feel is ready to travel and I ask them, where do you want to go? I take them to New York, pay for two weeks to train under some of the pioneers in New York, take them to the West Coast, travel under the pioneers of the West Coast, wherever they want to go, I take them, I pay for the 2,000, 3,000, whatever they want, and then they take it back to their neighborhood, and then they teach their generation over there. Okay? That's a uh, civilian issue, so be on the lookout for that. Okay? Cool. Uh, so, you've traveled quite a lot, uh, obviously. Um, what do you think... <laughs> Is there anything wrong with our current culture at the moment in time and do you think there's any aspects that could be improved upon or you would like to see changed? In our culture? Current. Did you guys hear the question or no? No. no. Okay. So, so currently. It's no, a real good question. Okay. Say it now. I'm black and I'm proud. <laughs> so currently, um, I just wanted to ask for whether, because uh, he's an observer, uh, whether he sees anything wrong with our current culture as we perceive it and is there anything that he would like to see changed or he would like to, you know, improve that kind of stuff. Okay, this is a great opportunity for that, okay. I don't see anything wrong with the culture, to be honest, um, in the aspect of you have a room full of people. Record this on camera, okay. You have a room full of people all different ethnic backgrounds, nationalities, religions, colors, and everything. To me, there is nothing wrong with that because that's what God wants. We're all brothers and sisters no matter what God you pray to. Okay? Christian, Muslim, Ja, Allah, Buddhist, whatever. It's the same source. Okay? And we're all brothers and sisters and that's what God wants. And me seeing that here and having thousands of people outside walking around and just enjoying life, when there's a lot of war and killing right now, okay? I think we, as a culture, the only thing we're not doing is recording ourselves together, 2,000 people holding hands of every color and giving a message to Pakistan and Lebanon and all these Muslims fighting Muslims and everybody arguing and telling them that this is the generation we want. I think we need to stand up for that because we have power. I think we don't know how much power we actually have. And I think that's the only thing wrong with the culture. We come, we dance, we have a good time, but there's people dying out there that needs to hear our voice and tell them that we know what's going on and we stand with you and we hold hands and we say, end that shit. We tell the government or whoever's doing it, end that shit. 
because we're the power here. We're the generation that makes the change in this world. Okay? that we should change is really the hypocrisy of us talking about styles and they ain't doing it right and da 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 and woo woo all that's crap it's about expression feeling we should hold hands and do do what's right okay that's all good question all right any other questions go ahead brother uh, going back to um, going back for a second on one subject thing the other side of the I'm personally uh, I'm a rapper so Heart into it, get out there, show people what you do, and people are gonna accept it. You know what I'm saying? Like if you really have your heart into it, you're honest with it, I, and you market yourself well by being out there. You know what I mean? Sometimes you gotta do free stuff, man. You know what I mean? Just throw yourself out there. Start with the hat, start with the t-shirt, start with graphic design, and start with the flyer. Somebody's gonna see it, oh, who did that flyer? They're gonna say so and so, here's his number. And the connects start happening, the next thing you know, it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But always treat yourself like, um, never shortchange yourself. Don't limit yourself. I've done tons and tons of free stuff with people. It's weird because like, I've, I've kind of done, I've done this, this, this and this with somebody. And then my boss brought me to, to this part here. And then all of a sudden, I'm not like, uh, so I said, oh, I wanted to do, I wanted to do this big gym. And they're like, it looks like my money behind and I'm charging I'm charging X so much and like going to Google, you know, but it's, it's hard to tell because like some people will be like really it's, uh, it's, um, I'm not used to talking to kind of, It's all good. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's kinda it's kinda like it's hard to to bridge that gap between uh, um, how you sell something to best of and learn to do it in a different way. Uh, um, you can't if I try to, if someone from the ghetto wants me to say, wants to buy something, it's always trying to sort it feels like I'm getting get short change all the time. Yeah, and if I get somebody I don't know, like, yeah, um, with lots of business, it's like, I can talk about one of this, you know? So Are you asking how to hustle, Lee? There doesn't seem to be any, uh, so um, like yeah. uh, big way with it. So well, I think you kind of answered your own <coughs> question right there. Yeah. You kind of answered it. If somebody has a store and they got the money and all that, then you set your standard, you set your price. I'll tell you this much, if Adidas was sponsoring IBE, you know, yeah. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't accept the pay that I would be getting now, because it's Adidas and Puma, or whoever. These are multi-billion dollar companies, you know? I would set my pay, you know? I would say, no, they're not the culture, they're actually capitalizing from our culture, yeah. okay? So I set a certain rate for them. You know, but if it's like you said, a ghetto dude and just, yo, can you do me a hat, how much you charge me? Yo, dog, I'm not gonna charge 150 bucks to do him a little quick thing that's gonna take me 15, 20 minutes. You know what I mean? I'm gonna do that to the business guy. You know, you understand what I mean? So I think you answered your own question. I think you know when to do it and when not to do it. Follow your heart, that's the most thing. You know what I'm saying? Does that make sense, you guys? Yeah, you know, word, word. You know? Simple as that. Other questions, you guys? I know it's late. Uh, what kind of lifestyle changes do you make uh, to keep on dancing? Ooh. Lifestyle changes that I made to keep on dancing. Uh, good question. I never thought about that. I actually, as I get older, I'm trying to take care of more of my body. Okay? I'm trying to eat right trying to get sleep right, not at this hour, okay? You know, trying to really meditate and uh, put positive thoughts into my brain. Every morning I do affirmations. Do you guys know what affirmations are? 
An affirmation is when, instead of waking up every morning and looking at yourself and say, damn, I look like shit. <laughs> Which a lot of people wake up every morning and say, ah, oh, I look like shit. Instead of saying that, every morning I wake up and say, yo, cool, you ready to go? Today's a good day. And I go out and I rock it. You understand what I mean? So I change my frame of mind. Instead of complaining and, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be the change I want to be, like Gandhi says. Okay? So as I'm getting older, I'm just like, yo, I want to stay in the game. I can't do all the flying stuff that everybody's doing. So I watch, I observe, and the more details I learn, the funkier I get. So to me, it's like eating right, thinking right, drinking water right, you know, uh, being building with people, being positive has made a big impact in my life in a different way. Okay? So I think that is very important. All right, make the change, you guys. If you want to see a change in the world, in your neighborhood, if you tell me that your scene is whack, and, and, and it's your scene, and you're a part of that scene, then it's your fault too. Because if you're saying my scene is whack, and you're in that scene, then it's your fault. Because if you ain't doing anything to change it, then you're part of the problem. It's, a, it's that simple. So I'm trying to do the change I want to see in my world. And that's a lot through dancing and all that. So as simple as that, you guys. Does that make sense? Cool. Good question. Okay, two more questions and we finish and we go get drunk. So much for healthy living. <laughs> No more questions, you guys? <laughs> well, back in the days, you got little information. So you got to squeeze all the information. You got to, you got to be in that scene. So now we live in a day that uh, there's a lot of information about YouTube and stuff like that. So it's not more intense than how I uh, experienced it. So my question, or I want some advice, uh, how can you teach the next generation how I learn way of the way of people? Because now it's a lot of information, so you can type a bell or whatsoever, and they say, okay, well, that's a great bell. But in my days, I got one DVD or one cassette, and I, uh, my former crew, I just passed it. Wow, well, okay, you must learn that. You must I think the new generation gets hyped their own way, the same way we got hyped what we saw. You know what I'm saying? I think, uh, to answer your question... But it's a fact that um, the less information there is, the more you do. So, there's a lot of information, so you've got to live this life as well. I think, for, for one, you guys, um, I don't try to um, preach, preach, preach. Sometimes you get tired of hearing somebody preach. Sometimes you just want to watch the brother get down. You know? I think sometimes just getting down shows them everything. I don't think if you guys weren't interested in the culture, I don't think you would be sitting here at 3 in the morning listening to me talk. <laughs> you understand what I mean? I think you're learning something from the talks and learning something from the information. Yes, Paul. Paul. I have to say, our reality back in the days, do you think that we looked in the future? Oh, sorry. Yeah, we didn't really you, think, you think that we looked in the future and we thought, like, wow, but in the future, we're going to have a lot of information. <laughs> <laughs> so for us, back in the days, we had a lot of information. It's only now that we found out that we didn't. So basically what Paul is saying, like you guys lived the exact same way as we did back in the days. Of course when we went to a hip-hop jam we had a lot of information because instead of seeing that one breaker that you were dancing with all the time, you saw five. Yeah? And you were happy about it. And that was everything, you know, it's, it's a matter of how you process it, that's all. You know, if you go into a candy shop and you like candy, if you put your belly full of candy, you're gonna throw up. You know, you learn how to process that too. And it's the exact same way. <laughs> There's no magic to it, you know? They're here, they're vibing, they're seeing the house DJs, they're seeing the funk DJs, they're going to the breaking room. 
they're doing exactly, we had it in one room, you know, in a party. The DJ played different music, disco and all that, so you guys are experiencing, you guys get to walk, you're doing exactly what we were doing, but some of y'all are older age. You gotta remember, when I was doing it, I was 12 years old. Some of you guys are 18, 19, 20, 25, getting involved in the culture. I will say the difference is um, what I said earlier with that, this brother's question. The essence of the culture was created by kids, playing, being kids. The DJs and the pictures you see were 17-year-old, 16-year-old kids. The B-Boys, when you watch Beat Street, okay, Beat Street came out, what, 84? Yeah, okay, 1984, I was 14 years old. Kenny and them were 16 or 17 years old. Look at the style. Look at the way they walked in the club and the way they would look at people. It wasn't just the movie, their attitude and stuff was like that. You understand what I mean? The culture, they lived it and they were babies. Babies. So you have to understand, if you're 20, 30 years old, and you're getting involved in the culture, you need to become that kid again inside. Okay? That playful kid that is behind that closed doors when you're home and your favorite rap song comes on. When Hard Times used to come on from Run DMC, I'd put my Kango on, fill it up with plastic, put it on, take the laces off my Adidas and look in the mirror and act like them. Boom, boom. And my mother would talk, knock on the door, like turn the music down and I'll take everything off and open the door and say, hey mom, what you doing? And I would be different. But that kid that was behind that door is the kid that would go to the circles and show the world who, they, who he or she truly was. Does that make sense? Still, I think... You still do it. I still do it. Okay? Right. So answer your question, to teach the next generation, yo, track two taught me the best thing in a workshop. In 2007, I think it was 2007, um, Mighty Four did a thing in um, Seattle. And Track, Ness, myself, Remind, we were all judging, and Remind went to teach a workshop. So I was leaving to the workshop, and Track, one of my teachers, thank God, okay, and he says, Paul, where are you going? I said, oh, I'm going to go to Remind's workshop. He goes, I'll go with you. I said, okay, cool. So we're at the workshop. Reminds explaining stuff, and then he's asking me, Yo, Poe, how was this in the 80s for you? Because Reminds not an 80s guy. So you had three different people in that workshop. You had a 1975 B Boy, track two. You had a 1980s B Boy, 82 B Boy, me. Then you had the early 90s, late 80s, 89, 90 B Boy, which was Remind. So for, for, for me, it was like an honor because whatever I was breaking down, I would look at track and say, Yo, how was it in the 70s? He didn't physically do it, but he said, Poe, just do it this way. So I would analyze and just try to rock and he said, yeah, exactly. Cool. So Remind asked Trap. He goes, yo, Trap, I'm 28 years old or whatever his age was at that time. And he goes, Trap, why the hell do we still call ourselves B-Boys? Okay, why? If I'm a man now, I'm not a little boy anymore when I got involved in the culture. And Trap 2 looked at him and said, you know what? All day. You have rules. When you go to work, you have rules. When you go to school, you have rules. You have a girlfriend, she's telling you what to do. Put the toilet seat up. Put the toilet seat down. Wash the dishes. Do this, do that. From the moment, from the moment you turn on music and you start dancing, when there is no rules, no nothing, what comes out? What re comes out to play? What? You answer me. The child. the child. So he looked at Remind and he said, that's why we're still called B-Boys and B-Girls. Because the child comes out to play. When he said that, it just clicked. And I said, this is why I've never fucking grew up. Oh, excuse me. I never grew up. Okay? This is why I never grew up. I'm a man when I have to be. But yo, I'm 44 years old. And my friends that grew up with me at, at my age... They got gray hair, they're super fat, they're sitting on couches, they're not doing what I do. They look at me and they say, how the hell did you stay so long, young? And I said, because I'm a b-boy.
Good night, you guys.